Hey guys, so today uh, we're gonna do a new video. Uh, instead of talking about IQ, we're gonna be talking about IQ, no. We're gonna be talking about stereotype accuracy and uh, and of course inaccuracy or biases uh, if, if these occur. Uh, let's do the presentation. Uh, where was the presentation? Present. All right. So, stereotype accuracy, you can probably not really talk about this without talking about this guy. Who wrote this book not the guy on the, on the photo uh, so Lee Jossim he's a uh, an American Rutgers uh, professor of psychology um, he published this book in 2012 and uh, you should totally read it because uh, it's uh, it's good and uh, you don't really have an excuse because it's uh, it's free on the library Genesis Lipkin you know the Russian uh, the Russian ebook pirate site that you should totally be using and hopefully have been using for a long time because uh, information wants to be free. Uh, reading the book doesn't require any advanced stats knowledge because uh, it's kind of dumbed down enough that if you're just a, an average smart person of say 110 plus IQ you can probably read it. Um, the author is entertaining on Twitter so he likes to show and, and so on you can go uh, look him do that uh, or uh, read him do that and um, also reading the book actually wants to get you involved and uh, N1 here is that I read the book and I was like hey this is some good stuff I happen to have some good data sets for doing stereotype accuracy research so let me go do some studies um, and uh, yeah it's a fun book uh, the curious thing about this book is that uh, you know if you write a book in science and then like five years later it's usually become sort of outdated because uh, some things you you thought to be true or have now been debunked, and so it's it's outdated. It's in fact for this book, it's kind of the opposite. Um, it's become more correct since, uh, so to say, since it uh, since it was published. Because uh, after two thousand twelve, we had the whole replication crisis thing, and the replication crisis uh, mainly struck down a bunch of uh, social psychology stuff that they like and that uh, just same uh, he's critical about, like stereotype threat and self-fulfilling prophecies and some of this other stuff uh, it's probably gonna fall more because uh, a lot of this stuff was really built on extremely p-hacked sand um, and uh, it turns out the stereotype accuracy stuff wasn't uh, you can probably figure it out why it's because uh, stereotype accuracy stuff is uh, not very woke so it faces uh, a lot of peer review criticism. Basically, if you submit a paper with stereotype accuracy stuff, they're gonna the reviewers will always hate you, and so it's very difficult to get published. Um, so the ones studies that did get published, they were probably uh, creme de la creme, or you know, very good for for social psychology at least. Um, that being said, let's let's go on. And so uh, the first thing you have a problem with the stereotype uh, in stereotype research is is that they define stereotype in kind of an incoherent way. And the most incoherent is defining stereotype to be a belief about a group that they're all the same in some aspect. So there's kind of a, a group homogeneity. Everybody is equal in the group, right? Um, and uh, the first problem with this, is, of course, is that no one uses stereotype in this way. Um, and so, for instance, if we find that uh, someone says men are the tall than women, you'd have to be very stupid to think that this means that someone is claiming that all men are taller than all women. Or the tallest man is taller than the, or the shortest man is taller than the, the tallest woman you can find. No one, you know, no one uses words like this uh, in group differences because there are no group differences that are this absolute. Uh, well, almost none. Um, and so, if you say that uh, X is uh, is more in some trait than than Y, what you really mean implicitly is saying the average male height is larger than the average female height. Uh, because what else would you be talking about? There's no way, there's no reason to interpret it in a wrong way, right? Um, it's just kind of like when you're, you're feeling like being obnoxious, you can kind of misinterpret things this way. Um, the second nonsensical definition, quite common in stereotype literature, is the we define stereotypes to be inaccurate or exaggerated belief about a group. And, and so in this way, you can kind of see we put the uh, what we want to prove uh, into the definition. So it's kind of a begging the question definition. Um, it has some some funny implications, which is that uh, if you define stereotypes to be inaccurate, then you can't really call something a stereotype before you actually have a study saying proving it's inaccurate, right? Because how would you know, right? Uh, so you'd have to you'd have to reword paper titles to be uh, we're investigating some belief, and finally we determined yes, it is a stereotype. And also, if you find the belief to be actual accurate, uh, it wouldn't be a stereotype. 
uh, an accurate stereotype because that would be a contradiction, right? An inaccurate, accurate belief about a group that's uh, that's nonsense. Um, so it's kind of a very strange definition to use, um, but it's often used implicitly. Um, so a more sensible uh, definition of stereotype is simply a belief about a group um, in some about some trait, right? Uh, or it can be about group differences, but usually about a group, right? So uh, a stereotype about uh, blacks being criminal or uh, men being tall, it doesn't say that all blacks are criminal or all men are tall. We obviously, of course, know that's not the case, right? Uh, it just says that they're uh, high uh, according to whatever reference group we have. If it's uh, if it's human average, then men, of course, are taller because the only other kind of human we have is uh, women, right? Um, blacks, you can compare to whatever other group you have in society, Indians or something, right? Um, so methods. Um, the first thing you need is you need some criterion data. And the criterion data is basically what you take to be the, the truth. At least uh, that's how your methods work. Um, so it's it's assumed to be very accurate. Um, if it's obviously since we're not uh, gods here, we don't really know the actual truth. However, we have stuff like census data or register data or a large meta-analysis uh, that you could maybe assume to be correct. Maybe if you're feeling brave. Um, these you basically take for granted and then you compare the group uh, the estimates of the stereotype stuff against this reference. Um, and so what you do is that uh, once you figured out the stuff that people are supposed to rate, um, you you just basically survey some people and um, you can kind of, there's usually two ways to do this. You can, first, if you're a professor, you can demand free labor from your students and give them magic points of GPA and then students will, oh, you know, um, in magic grades and then they're, they're gonna work for you and give you some ratings um, the second option is you pay some people online to do that and so the real the real distinction is here is that do you want psychology to be the study of introduction students in psychology or do you want psychology to be the study of uh, people who answer surveys for low pay on the internet you can kind of take your choice of which you think is uh, is the group that will most likely uh, generalize to the wider society um, when you do a group uh, or a study, you, you have um, you have the choice to do a, a wide study or a, a long study, so we say a tall study. And so the width is, is the number of groups you're, you're estimating uh, stuff of, and the height uh, is the number of characteristics. And so if we do men and women, there's only two groups, um, and then you can compare them on a bunch of different characteristics, and you can have people answer how large they think the gender difference is on people who work in uh, in the fashion industry or people who work in as plumbers or, or people who work on something else right or height or something um, you can also do it the other way around you can have a ton of groups say uh, race groups or immigrant groups by country of origin or people who like this or that animal or people whose favorite color is XYZ and so on right uh, I'm sure some people think that uh, have some stereotypes about people who like the color black for instance, I would expect people who like the color black to be more depressed um, and probably people who like pink are more girly, uh, blue are probably more male and so on, right? Um, and so published studies on this question, they're usually either tall or white, uh, but not both because if you had, say, 10 groups and you asked people to rate uh, on 10 different things, you'd get 100 ratings, right? 10 times 10. Uh, so that would probably take a long time. So you'd have to pay them more and you'd have to make do with um, with the survey uh, tiredness or something. Uh, one option, of course, is here is that you could uh, assign people random stuff to random combinations to uh, to rate, in which case um, they wouldn't, each person wouldn't be rating the full set of stuff you're interested in. And so you would get a, uh, a designed missing data uh, study. I, I haven't seen it yet for stereotype accuracy, but uh, it could totally be done. Um, the, the things you ask people to rate are usually uh, group means if you're asking them to uh, to estimate groups per se. But you could also just, uh, if you only have two groups, you can ask people to rate the difference, right? Uh, there's no need to rate two means if all you're interested in this is how large the mean difference is. You, you actually don't have to do means. You could do you could ask people to do rate the uh, rate the tails. Um, the problem is that uh, you have the constraint that the people you're polling, they need to understand what they're being asked to do. So if you tell them, uh, please rate the 95th income uh, centile of men and women, 
a lot of people won't be they won't know what income income centiles are um so that's that's your problem um a second problem is that uh, data type really matters and you preferably want to use ratio scale data because that way you can do a bunch of more uh, methods or uh, that that you can't do with other data interval data or or quasi interval data uh, they have limitations because they don't uh, they don't really have true zeros and stuff like that um, further on um, there's different ways you can calculate accuracy or you can calculate inaccuracy um, you can also do the analysis at two levels and you can uh, you can first look at individuals personal uh, individual level accuracy or personal uh, stereotypes and you can also look at the average the average stereotype so you can either average them or take the mean or use whatever aggregation feature that you want maybe do some machine learning um, like to filter out people who seem to uh, give malevolent data or something um, the aggregate stereotype is uh, is probably the most important in the way that it's it's a measure of the average opinion of society of this or that group, at least on this trait. And uh, of course, for averages, then uh, opposite errors cancel out. So if someone thinks there's no sex differences and someone else thinks the, the sex differences are uh, extremely wide, like men are half a meter taller than women, then these average out and it becomes more accurate. Um, and probably if you're interested in, in, in causal effects, um, you're probably interested in the average as well, because uh, if someone discriminates extra hard against women and someone discriminates extra hard uh, uh, for or against them, then they kind of uh, average out, right? You, you're really interested in the average um, the average uh, belief here if you think stereotypes translate into action, and you probably should because uh, they, they appear to do so. Um, if you do individuals, you'll kind of get a, a, a distribution of stereotypes and, of course, uh, a distribution of accuracies uh, and biases and these can be of interest because you can relate each personal stereotype or a bias to any other variable that you want um, and so for instance you can have people who think that um, say women are more irrational you can ask these women or these people about say their uh, policy preferences regarding women and for instance if you, the people who think women are more rational they probably also think that women should stay more out of politics or at least they shouldn't be pushed into politics or or you know some other thing if uh, if if people think uh, men are prone to war uh probably you want to kind of get men out of politics so they don't start more wars um there actually is a study of country leaders and wars and it shows the opposite somehow uh i don't know if that's really true uh it's, it's definitely amusing though it's good to troll with um, um an interesting one i came up with is that um is that people who have more accurate stereotypes about sex uh, i would kind of expect them to be more successful in the mating game because, um, of course, if you know how the other uh, sex works, you probably are more successful in, in engaging with them. If you think women uh, really love uh, nerdy video games and you try to convince them to play video games with you, if that's your gaming, if that's, it's, if that's how you try to get women, you're probably not going to be very successful, right? Um, and so let's look at some concrete uh, values here because it's kind of it's kind of difficult to understand in the abstracts without going over something. Uh, so here, uh, I've made up some numbers. The criterion values are the numbers I've made up. We have three groups, and to be ultra PC, we've labeled them blues, greens, and purples, and you, they can kind of be your stand-in for whatever groups that you hate or love. And um, so I've rated them, well, I've given them uh, scores. These are the mean scores on, on four traits that, that I've also uh, made up. And I put them in the real units, uh, so height is in centimeters, BMI is in whatever BMI is in, and intelligence is in IQ points and happiness is just kind of in a 110 scale or 0 10 or something. Um, so what we really see is that the blues are really, really happy. Uh, they're not too smart. They're kind of average, a little bit below average height, and they're really fat. Uh, so that's kind of your mental image of them, like fat, stupid, um, not too tall, uh, but really happy. Um, greens, not happy at all, above average intelligence, kind of average height very skinny so they're kind of like lanky uh, know-it-all smart guy or 115s that's kind of that used to be college major mean and now it's more like reddit mean or something uh it's like a, it's like art bad science or something um purples are just kind of a, they're kind of tall but otherwise they're basically uh, they're basically average um these are also the population uh stats the mean and so on um over here 
I made up some estimates and scored them on accuracy. Uh, and so what we have is that we have three different subjects, A, B, and C, uh, who who's rated uh, these groups on height. So we're going to stick to height here because it's a ratio scale and that's nice. Um, so we see that um, they basically rate these groups and you can pause the video to look it over. Uh, we also have their average estimates. We can see, for instance, that C is, uh, is, is really rating people on average to be a lot uh, less tall than, uh, than the other people are. And uh, B has massive variation in how tall he thinks these groups are, right? Like he thinks uh, the standard deviation is really high because he thinks you know some group is 150 tall and the other one is two meters and so on. And, and A is kind of in between. Um, and since we know the real heights right here, we can, of course, calculate the uh, discrepancy. So the discrepancy is just uh, their estimate, and then um, you subtract the, the real score. So if, if uh, A estimates blues to be 185 on average, and we look them up, and they're actually only 170, they get a discrepancy of 15. They're 15 too, too tall, right? Their, their estimate was 15 too large. And, and the same way for every, every other uh, person and group estimate here. And again, you can calculate the means and standard deviations for these estimates. Uh, and so you see, for instance, that um, that B is estimating, uh, his estimates are also really uh, varied here, uh, that his discrepancies are varied, just like his estimates were, right? Um, interesting, what you can see is that, um, as you can see, B here has, has no mean uh, discrepancy. So on average, he wasn't like too high or, uh, or too low. So um, that tells you that tells you the what's called the elevation bias, which elevation error down here. So there's no there's no error on him because he was on average correct in his uh, his height guesses. Um, it's not the case for A. He was a bit he was a bit too uh, too tall. He was his average height guesses or estimates were a bit a bit too high. And C, as we talked about, he he is really too low. Um, in his estimates. So he's just kind of misperceived the average height and rate everybody too tall, basically. Um, another one that's interesting is you can calculate the um, the absolute discrepancy, which uh, is a, it's itself a, a direct measure of the error, but without the sign. So in this in this measure, we don't care about uh, we don't care about the um, we don't care about the uh, the way that people made their error incorrect. As long we just care about how far they were from the truth. And in this as well, you can, of course, see it. Um, and uh, so here we get the mean, and the mean absolute discrepancy is, is a direct measure of how far you were from the truth. And so if you look at this at this metric, uh, we see that A, overall, his estimates were, were the closest to the truth. B is a bit further, and, and C is really far from the truth on average. Um, down here, we can also see a different way of looking at it. We can look at the, uh, the correlation. So here we just take everybody's guesses and we correlate them with this vector of the truth and then we get these results and here we see that a has a correlation of 0.33 b is uh, 7 or 76 and c is 100 and so basically c with regards to the, uh, the 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 relative differences c got it perfectly right uh and uh if we can convince ourselves that this is true if we go back to c's estimates we see that uh he said 150 155 and 160 so he thinks there's equal differences between them and they come in the order blue uh, green and purple and of course if we look at the the, the values over here um, that's basically true um, actually the colors are fucked up uh, I forgot about that uh, whatever we're gonna be pretending that blue is purple so so we see that though C uh, he's rating everybody far too low he got the 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 relative difference is correct and that's why his correlation is one uh, on the other hand, if we look at uh, A, uh, he, he got the smallest mean error, but actually his correlation is not very good, and that's because he didn't kind of get, he only got the um, the real differences somewhat correctly. Uh, he got that the purple uh, one is the tallest, and so that's true. Um, but then he thinks the blues are, are quite tall, and they're not. So on average, um, he's not particularly accurate. Um, he's kind of middling accurate. Uh, and B is in between. Um, interesting thing about B is that um, you can look at his estimates and we see that they have a really high standard deviation. So they vary a lot. He thinks the group differences are really large. And however, we, if we look at the, the, the standard deviation over here, uh, we see that the true standard deviation is 10. And so if we subtract those, um, we get the value of 20. 
and um, so that's uh, he was really way too uh, dispersed in his guesses uh, than he should be. Um, and, oh, sorry, these are discrepancies. So if you calculate, yeah, the the difference um, between this one and this one, you'll see that he was really overestimating differences between groups, whereas the other two people were uh, slightly underestimating the real differences. Um, so this this value for a given person tells you uh, how much they overestimate them in groups. If it's if they think it's too much or too little, and the mean tells you how far they are on the the y-axis, the kind of overall scale. The R tells you whether they get the average rank order or the relative difference is correct. Um, this is say uh, so that's basically how you do stuff. And uh, this these you can only do with the ratio scale. Uh, so if we go here. Let's say you have a different scale. Uh, you have some trait that doesn't have an inherent ratio scale or asking about the ratio scale is too complicated for people. Uh, maybe if you're asking people to rate countries by uh, GDP per capita in in uh, international dollars, then many people, they won't really have an intuitive sense of, of how to do, uh, what these uh, how these scales work. They, they wouldn't know that, that uh, Denmark is, is 45,000 or something and US is 50. Norway 70. I don't, I don't really know what the numbers are, but it's going to be something close to that. But maybe a normal person would think that maybe the value is 100,000 or 10,000 or something. So they they would be very different. Uh, so they would all get massive elevation biases and that could probably distort your data. Anyway, in this case, I took the same data we were already familiar with, the height data, and I've converted all the data here to uh, C scales. Uh, simply how to do that is you just, um, you just subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And when you do this, then all the data gets a mean of uh, zero and a standard deviation of one. And so they're now all in the same scale. And you can see that uh, the differences we had before, uh, the blues are not tall, the purples are tall, and the greens are in between. This it happens to be that this translates into uh, minus one, zero, and, and one in standard deviation units. Uh, and so I've done the same thing for people's uh, estimates over here. And uh, so now we can see the C is perfect because in his uh, his own uh, C score, he's in his own C scale units. He estimates blues to be minus one, zero, uh, and one, and these are exactly the same as the truth. And so now he gets uh, discrepancies of exact zero, um, and so of course the mean is also zero. But you see the same problem if we look at uh, let's say the estimates of B. Now that his stuff has been C scaled, he's his mean and his standard deviation of estimates is also one and zero, and the same is true for A, right? Everybody's uh, that's what that's what standardizing the, the number numbers do, right? And so you see that on our accuracy metrics, um, the mean um, is now is always zero. You can't get the mean off if you're using a metric where you've removed the mean, right? Uh, that that makes sense, uh, and you can't get the dispersion wrong because you've also set the dispersion to one, and it's one by definition in so basically, these these uh, elevation and dispersion errors, they're not there. You can't calculate this kind of accuracy if you don't use ratio data. So that's the trade-off, right? If you use traits where people can't use radio radio ratio scale data, not radio data, although that would be interesting. Uh, ratio scale data, then you can only kind of use these correlation metrics. Uh, so you gotta you gotta think about that when you decide uh, design the study. So so what is what is accurate and what is is not accurate? Uh, in in uh, social science, uh, we have a lot of these schemes where you can look up some effect size and you can kind of look up an interpret interpretation guide and you can see uh, is this is this considered to be a strong effect or a weak effect? And uh, Lee he just tells us uh, Lee is Justin right? Uh, Justin he just tells us we're just going to use the normal scheme right? So the most commonly used one and the, the most wrong one sort of is the Cohen and um, it's kind of ironic because when Cohen made up these terms. He actually didn't base it on anything. He, he was just kind of sitting in his armchair. He was going on his pipe and then he came up with these values. And um, however, since he was the first to apparently come up with these, they kind of went viral in a positive feedback. So one, some people started citing them and now everybody cites them. So the paper he has uh, or the book he has with this, uh, with these uh, interpretation guidelines, it has like 20,000 citations now. So that's kind of how science works. Uh, so it's a, it's a little fucked up. And um, of course, since uh, there's a lot of jealous people in science, they all they all look at his 20,000 citations and they want to say, hmm, how can I also get 20,000 citations? And so what they do is that they publish 
uh, revisions of his guidelines, and so now they're hoping that people will cite them instead of instead of Cohen. Um, so, the, so there's like ten different uh, papers that all have calculated kind of what is an average effect size for some given field or some kind of study, um, this sort of thing. Uh, one of them here um, is by Gignac, I think it's French name, even though he is Australian or maybe New Zealand. Uh, he's uh, an intelligence researcher. Um, he looked at the individual differences literature. And so that's not sociology. It's like studies that relate one individual trait with some other one. And usually you get a correlation. Well, you basically always get a correlation or something like that. Um, so he looked at that in psychology and he got that a small, which he considered to be a 25th, uh, 25th centile result, that correlation about 0.11 and 50th was uh, point, um, 0.19 and 75, uh, 75th was uh, 0.19. So if we cheat a little, we'll say it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. That would kind of be typical relative large effect size in these fields. Uh, of course, it should be said that uh, since people engage in p-hacking, these values are probably a little too large. Uh, but we're, if we're just going to ignore that and be nice, uh, point, point 0.10, point 0.2, uh, and uh, point 0.3, that's kind of a that's kind of a useful benchmark to think about, like mentally. Um, Jasim, in his, uh, he kind of came up with some different ones, and uh, it turns out that uh, these studies on stereotype accuracy, they've all kind of used different ones, uh, well, mostly, and. Um, and so his his ones are if you have absolute data, then uh, you can say that an estimate was correct if it's within 10 percent. Um, if it's a uh, ten to twenty percent, he thinks it's an EMS, and if it's more than twenty percent off the real value, he calls it inaccurate. However, sometimes you only have uh, c-scored data. In this case, he he translate this to to how far off you are in the, in the c-value. Uh, in this case, you can see on the screen, it's uh, if it's less than 0.25 off in, in C-score units, he thinks it's accurate and so on. Uh, for correlations, he thinks that it must be above 0.4 to think it's accurate, which is a uh, which is quite f uh, quite a tough requirement because um, that's larger than even the the 75th centile of p hack results in psychology. So that's really strict. So basically, Jasim is being too nice to people. And the reason he's doing that is, of course, that the effect sizes are really large in this literature, so he can, he can kind of get away with it. Um, speaking of that, here is uh, an overview of empirical results. Um, it's very helpful that Lee, he, he likes to publish a new one of these every three years, uh, citing the same studies, but, you know, in a new way, uh, more or less. Because there's not many people who do studies in this, so, like, updating the meta-analysis involves adding two new studies or something like that. And then basically harassing the latest uh, rounds of sociologists who ignore this data. So he's gonna he cites them and say, "Hey guys, you're ignoring the data." And then they keep ignoring it. And then three years later, he can cite some new people who also ignored it, and so on. Right? That's how it works. Uh, so however, we're gonna use the new one, which is uh, this one, which I don't think has been published, but it's on well, not in a journal, but it's on it's on Psych Archive and um, Psych Archive. I don't know how to say it. Um, and it's the newest one I could find. Um, if you look at his studies, he comes out with kind of a crude meta-analysis, kind of taking the median, something like this. Uh, you get a rest ethnicity, uh, median accuracy or mean accuracy across these studies, uh, 0.7, which is absurdly high uh, by any kind of social science standard. And if you do it by sex, it's 0.8 or so, which is even higher. Um, if you look at uh, mean and in median individual accuracy, it's about 0.55 for race and 0.45 for sex. So as you can see, these these values are absurdly large by average effect sizes in, in psychology. Uh, however, there are some problems with these uh, these studies, which is that uh, a lot of them are quite old, like 70s, 80s, some 90s, and there's not that many of them. Like the the values for these estimates, they're based on like uh, five studies or ten studies or so um, each, right? And uh, the other problem with this is that um, many of these studies, they don't report all the metrics. So one study will, will give you values enough. You can calculate the correlation accuracy. A different study will only report the ac absolute discrepancies or the average absolute discrepancy or something like that. So you can only score them on one metric at a time. Uh, it would be preferable, of course, if, if all the studies reported the, all the data and all the metrics at once. So you could, you could do a meta-analysis effectively, but uh, science being shitty as it is, you can't do this. Uh, Probably the data for these old studies is lost, uh, although I haven't asked, actually, I actually write to all the authors and ask 
because it would be nice to recover one of them, right? Um, whatever the case is at, so of course we have to ask, have to ask ourselves, will it replicate? Will it blend? Will it replicate? Uh, and it is social psychology after all, and nothing in that field seems to replicate very well. Um, the other reason, of course, is that there's not many studies of it that don't, not many people want to study it. If you look at social psychologists, not too many of them are interested in looking at, hmm, I wonder if stereotypes are actually accurate. Um, they would more like to, to prove them inaccurate by kind of skirting on the accuracy issue, right? Um, that's also the second problem. Even if you find the 5% of social psychologists who would kind of be okay with this sort of thing, where do they publish stuff? Well, in the Journal of Social Psychology, which is edited by some left winger, right? So it's hard to publish because you're going to get uh, hostile reviewers and the editor is probably going to desk reject you, right? So you have to try it 10 times or whatever to get it out. And even if you do manage to publish it, maybe in some other journal, you're going to get a hostile reaction from your uh, from your colleagues and maybe some social justice students. So why would you want to do that? Um, so overall, it's just bad for your career to spend time and money trying to publish something that no one likes. So few people do it. Uh, so... We're going to walk over uh, a few example studies here, aside from the fake data. And uh, so this one is one uh, one of the ones I made. So I read uh, the Jusin book and I wondered, hmm, what about stereotype accuracy of immigrant groups? Because as far as I know, no one has actually published on this before. So we, what did we do? We, we uh, pre-registered the methods, uh, which were quite detailed. And then uh, we got a large-ish survey of people and we had a bunch of... Uh, uh, data control because we know that people who answer surveys for money they basically want money and uh, they skip ahead on questions that they don't care about and so they just kind of click through if it gets boring and when you get people who kind of click through all the time uh, their not their data is just kind of noise or at least partially noise and so it's not good for you so we we used extensive controls to to get rid of bad data um, in our case for criterion data we used the proportion of people aged 30 to 39 who receive social welfare. And so this has a precise definition in Danish uh, registries. Um, and uh, we purchased data for a different study um, for this value. So we knew exactly how many, which proportion of these 30 something year olds uh, receive social welfare in Denmark for that year uh, for, for 17 groups, 70, 70, that's a lot of groups. Um, and so if you calculate uh, each person's um, individual accuracy and you plot the data, it looks like this figure. And what I've outlined on the, uh, the, the red line here, that's the median accuracy. And the reason, of course, you use the median is that there, you have some outliers. And um, especially what you see down here is that uh, we have some people who have reverse accuracy, which is odd. Uh, so we were wondering, have these people misunderstood the survey question? So we kind of tried to make it more explicit, but but no, we still kept getting 5% uh, or 7% or, or so uh, of people, I think it was, uh, of people who kind of gave reverse answers. And so what we do is we kind of, we cheated them. So we did a follow-up survey, but only of these people, but we didn't tell them they would be singled out. We just uh, surveyed everybody. Uh, well, that's what we said in the survey. And so um, we asked them if they gave honest uh, honest answers to the the stereotype question and uh, we found that a lot of these people actually say no um, they didn't and if you read the comments of their original submissions uh, a lot of these comments actually have stuff where they uh, they complain about this kind of study it's unethical to study stereotypes blah 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 uh, this sort of thing and it's usually of course people who also indicate that they vote for some kind of left party right uh, so so everything kind of works out you understand now why at least some of these people give reverse answers is, is because they're trying to counterbalance these people and so we, we worked out uh, statistically how, how wrong would you expect people to kind of get if they had no accuracy, how many of them would you kind of expect in the negative range? And so I did a simulation and the blue line shows uh, this kind of the, the, ninth, uh, the so people give significantly wrong answers if, if, uh, compared to just if you just give random answers, right? And so everybody on this, the other side of this blue line, they correspond to people who, who seem to have either misunderstood the question or like deliberately trying to give you opposite answers, which uh, seems to correspond well with this kind of cluster of uh, people. So that was interesting. Um, if you look at the aggregate accuracies, uh, so this is just the mean. You take For every estimate, you take the mean. Uh, you may think, 
shouldn't you take the median to get rid of the other people or maybe take uh, some other kind of aggregate function and we tried these and it turns out it doesn't make a lot of difference and we just they actually using the mean works the best um, because apparently it's more efficient uh, that's what statisticians mean about efficient in some ways anyway so we, since we have 70 countries we have them here on this plot and I've labeled the countries um, so these are these are immigrant groups in Denmark uh, and how much they receive on welfare stuff is on the x-axis and the mean estimate is, is on the y-axis right and what we see is that um, there's a bunch of countries that basically don't use uh, too much welfare these are all clustered in the the left bottom um, these are called basically all the western immigrants and some of the uh, non-western ones uh, depending on which country uh, like Nigerians in this case, you can see they're actually also doing quite well in Denmark, not just uh, UK or uh, US. So the lead Nigerian is real. Uh, however, we see that uh, there's a bunch of Muslim countries um, that don't do well, like Somalia, um, Afghanistan, Lebanon. Actually, uh, Syria here. Um, this data is from 2012, so that's before the recent wave, and I don't recall if that's before the recent uh, civil war, but it may be, or maybe it's kind of on the, the initial part of it. Um, it. It doesn't really matter in this case because most of these people are from uh, who immigrated to Denmark way before uh, the recent Syrian war. Um, so they're not really just people who came as refugees during that war and haven't settled in Denmark yet. There are people who've been there for a while. In any case, you can see that the average stereotype uh, correlates 0 0.7 with the with the actual welfare use. And if you go back to uh, to Sim's results, we see that the race uh, as Nitsi, the metanals he had was 0.7. So, in fact, our replication, based on large sample, got exactly the same value that he estimated should be the case, even though we kind of used new group and we aren't exactly studying race ethnicity, although we're kind of doing it indirectly. Um, so that's kind of interesting uh, and impressive. Um, second, if you had this plot, here I'm plotting how many people you kind of need to aggregate to get the full accuracy of your stereotype. And um, so this line is, is made by, uh, by picking, picking at people at random, uh, say picking one person at random and picking a different person and so on. And calculating the average accuracy you get this way uh, by just resampling it. And if you do this a lot of times, you get, a, you get an average and you can plot this. And you can see this diminishing returns, Spearman prophecy law sort of situation where as long as you pull like 30 people or so, you kind of don't need many more for your study because you hit, really hit the point of diminishing returns. Uh, since we know the, the value after uh, 400, almost 500 people is about 70. If you do 100, you're very close uh, to that value. You were at like 68 or something like that, maybe more, um, 69 probably. So you don't really need to pull that many people to estimate stereotype actually at the group level. Uh, you just need to pull 100 or so. It's probably fine. So we went further. Um, in this case, on the left side, we're looking at the absolute delta of the aggregate stereotypes and, uh, and the population size of Denmark. So on the left axis, on that left, the x-axis, you see the population size of, of immigrant groups in Denmark on a log 10 scale. And so this is how many zeros kind of you need to add. Um, and so we see, for instance, a group like Turkey is the largest one in Denmark, uh, has a bunch of people. Uh, I guess this number means they have about uh, 100,000, a bit less than 100,000 people. And um, something like Tanzania, there's only a, there's not even 1,000 people in Denmark. Uh, and so what we're interested in is that if people base their, uh, their stereotypes on people they meet in their own daily life, then you'd expect uh, the stereotypes to be more accurate for large immigrant groups because if it's larger, then you have a higher chance of knowing someone who's from Turkey or from Tanz. Tanzania or from Lebanon or Kuwait. Uh, however, uh, when we compare the absolute delta, um, the absolute discrepancy, that's the absolute delta, to the population size, we, we find nothing. Right, The correlation is extremely small and not, uh, not significant at all. Um, there's only 69 groups here because uh, Denmark isn't an immigrant group and it would be over here if you included it. And so it really just screws up the results. Um, if you do add it though, you don't really find anything either. Uh, so that, that, that hypothesis was not confirmed, uh, it was uh, discarded. The second one we tested here is the mean estimation error and the proportion of countries uh, with uh, a lot of Muslims. Uh, and so uh, if you think that uh, stereotypes are biased against Muslims, 
you would expect people to, on average, overestimate uh, the amount of Muslims who uh, receive welfare, right? Uh, in fact, we find that the opposite is the case, which is uh, sort of surprising. We find that, uh, on average, people underestimate uh, the Muslim groups by about 10 percent point. So uh, if the average Muslim group receives um, a typical Muslim group that has close to 100 percent Muslims in the origin country, right? Uh, if they receive, say, 50 percent on average welfare, the actual people estimate value, the stereotype is, is about 40. So that, that was very surprising uh, and interesting. Um, you can also see that the one they get it really wrong is Kuwait, which of course made us uh, think. And so we looked into that one. Um, if we start with the Kuwait one, so what we did there is that we looked at the uh, the countries that people get wrong, right? And um, so the ones they get uh, quite wrong uh, are uh, Kuwait. And so people think that Kuwait, uh, people from Kuwait are actually doing quite well. If we go back to the we think that uh, they are here. So in real life, uh, people from Kuwait are actually over 60% of them in this age group, 30 to 39, are receiving uh, social welfare, which is a lot. And uh, But the average estimate people give is, is 20, right? Uh, so they're off by, by 40 percent points, right? Which is amazing. So that's that's the 40 down here. Um, they're, 40, they're 42 low. Uh, and uh, so that makes this. And so what's, what seems to be the case is that we la re related this to uh, GDP per capita. And it seems that people are kind of using GDP per capita as a proxy for stereotypes. And so uh, people don't really use uh, stereotypes of people if they know a bunch of people from, say, Kuwait, because probably no one knows them. And um, but what they use is kind of they have a kind of mental image about a country. It's like hmm, Kuwait is one of the oil countries. So people from there. Uh, they grew up with a lot of money, so they're probably doing well. Uh, and it turns out that's totally not the case. Uh, and Kuwait is a is a big outlier there. Um, so that was interesting, but that was an, a, a post hoc analysis. It was not something we predicted. Um, and another interesting one is that if again, if we look at the uh, the bias for Muslims, instead of calculating this for each uh, aggregate estimate, you can calculate it for each person how uh, how much they are, uh, they're off. For the Muslims uh, on average and so you can get a kind of Muslim correlation error it's how much their uh, residual uh, from their estimates correlates uh, with the um, with the Muslim percent and so of course if you, if you think of um, standard regression theory you know that residuals are not supposed to be correlated with anything and so if they are they indicate uh, some kind of omitted variable or something something is wrong with your model um, so we were of course interested in is, is, is it whether people who say they're higher and lower nationalism, whether they uh, are more wrong about m Muslims, because, of course, the relationship with Muslims is, is the primary thing that distinguishes people who say they're nationalistic versus people who say they're not very nationalistic. Um, and so uh, to, what we're expecting to see is that uh, we're, we're kind of expecting kind of a you know smug centrist approach where you have to have some level of nationalism, but if you're an extreme nationalism, you're probably off on the other side of Muslims, right? You're overestimating the one Muslims on benefits. Um, so we, we asked people to estimate their own nationalism on a zero to 100 scale. And it turns out that there is no such pattern. Um, in fact, there's just more and more accuracy once you go up the nationalism scale, which was very surprising. Um, if, if the smug centrism thing was true, then this line should have crossed zero and been up here so that people would say 50 or 25 or 75 or so. Uh, self-rated nationalists, they should have been the most accurate with regards to the Muslim groups or shown no bias. But in fact, the most extreme nationalists in our study are still somewhat in biased towards Muslims in their estimates, which is uh, <laughs> kind of a funny finding. Um, so basically, the message to nationalists out there is that, you know, keep going and apparently you're not extreme enough. Um, um, so let's go to a different example. So this study is not mine. Well, not entirely mine. Um, there's these people, they did a, a study on Vue um, et al. And they did a study of uh, stereotypes about uh, movie genre preferences. And uh, so instead of using real genre pref uh, data from, say, people who go to the movies, they asked some people to estimate, to give their own preferences, and then also to estimate the ones of the, the sex, uh, the, of the other sex, or maybe they asked them for men and women, I forgot exactly. But... Basically, they ended up with a bunch of um, estimates for each sex based on people's self-report and the ones they estimate for the other sex. 
uh, in their own study, they do a bunch of complicated stuff that no one cares about uh, with the with the Novos and stuff like that. Um, so it's not very vivid the way they presented the data. Um, however, they were good guys. So they gave some tables that had the summer statistics. And of course, if you get the summer statistics, that's all you need to calculate aggregate stereotype accuracy. So behold, I replotted their data and it looks like this. Uh, so now we see that the accuracy is, is stunning, right? Uh, the the actual preference of a given sex is extremely strongly correlated with the stereotype of 8.5, which is not too surprising. Um, some of the outliers can also be interesting. Uh, Sci-fi is the bigot outlier, and it, it, it may be explainable by something like maybe recently there was a bunch of sci-fi movies that had uh, very female uh, themes, but kind of when men were thinking about sci-fi, they were kind of thinking about a different subset of movies than when women were thinking about sci-fi. Um, it's speculative, but uh, a different way of getting this is, of course, have people... Uh, you can go to IMDb, you can look at rating difference between men and women on a given movie and maybe use that. Uh, it's also problematic because um, you choose to see movies uh, yourself, uh, at least usually. And uh, so people who really don't like romance uh, or romantic comedies, they probably don't rate them. Uh, they don't watch them and then they don't rate them on IMDb afterwards. So you kind of get a, a self-selection into movies for liking them. That being said, it's still, that's a different kind of uh, data set to use. Or you could give people a, a list of movies and ask them uh, and use this to to uh, gauge people's likingness of, uh, of these kind of movie genres and then get the sex difference from that. Whatever the case, it's, it's worth exploring in more detail, but the accuracy here is, is definitely off the charts. Uh, to give an example of one that's inaccurate, I had to look. Uh, there's basically two inaccurate ones I could find in the literature. One of them is based on uh, country personality data. Uh, since I think this data is bunk, so the, I think the criterion data is wrong, um, then I don't think it's very sensible. However, um, there is one for... Um, let's make more space here. There is one for um, US political groups and it shows some extreme inaccuracy um, and so uh, it's this big thousand people online survey they ask people to do uh, voter demographics for the uh, different parties and then also uh, people to estimate them the ones from the different party and so they ask them you know about union members or these uh, coerty uh, liberty blah, blah blah people black people atheist agnostics and southerners over 65 very rich and super christians and so you can see that there's some extreme discrepancies in some of these. Um, if the uh, if you ask Republicans, I think, uh, yeah, ask Republicans about how many uh, of Democrats are, are coerced to people, they think it's 30%, but it's more like 7% or something like that, right? Um, so they were extremely far off. They were off by a lot of points. Unfortunately, they didn't ask for enough questions that you could actually really do a correlation of much because there's only four traits here, right? Um, so, well, that would be interesting. Um, I would also be very interesting to see if this replicates in other countries. So, I shall be see if I can maybe do a study about this in Denmark. Uh, in Denmark, instead of having two parties, we have 10 or so parties. And so, it would be kind of interesting to see what kind of stereotypes people have about these uh, and how accurate they are. Uh, I think that would be somewhat more accurate, uh, but maybe not. We'll see. So, uh, let's get more interesting. So, we're going to go into to more philosophy or politics here and um, what's still keeping it empirical, so to say. Uh, stereotypes and rationality, you kind of have this uh, this rash Bayesian rationality and, of course, uh, it's mainly based on this Bayes theorem, uh, which is, is shown here for those who are so inclined. Uh, the, but uh, the, the general theory is, uh, the general thinking is simple enough. Um, the idea is that whenever you are, have some belief and you then get some new evidence uh, to update it with, then your new belief, the posterior, that which comes after, should be based on the new evidence and the prior, whatever the belief and evidence you had before. And this process is called updating. And so the idea is that you start up with some belief, you look at some data, you go like, hmm, this changes my opinion towards X or C or Y or whatever. And so you, then you'd read some different data and you update a little bit more and eventually you kind of get closer and closer to the truth. Um, it's an iterative process. That's, that's, that's the theory, right? Um, and so stereotypes, as we've seen, we've defined them in a sensible way that they're beliefs about groups. And so if you think that, uh, that uh, 
the greens are really tall, that's that's your expectation. If you don't know anything else about a green, uh, you're gonna expect them to be tall. But of course, you can be you, you can be right or wrong. There's there's a variation within the group, right? Maybe you maybe you find a an extremely tall green, or you, maybe you find a, a really short green. Who knows? Um, so, but in real life, what this means is that you have some stereotypes about various groups. And so, for instance, if you're avoiding vegans, that's probably because you think vegans are obnoxious. Uh, maybe they're preachy, or maybe they use a bunch of obnoxious arguments that are false from the New York Times or whatever it is that you you think about vegans. Um, if you're swiping right on well-educated people on Tinder, um, I mean that's probably because you you have some beliefs about people who have long educations. Maybe you think they're smarter or don't take drugs or take more drugs. Uh, whatever the case, uh, maybe you just really like money and you want someone who makes more money, right? Um, if you avoid like very religious people or people who say support gun rights or whatever, it's because you have some stereotypes, right? So everybody, everybody has stereotypes. And uh, as we've seen, they tend to be uh, mostly accurate or at least to get the, the average rank order or so correct. And uh, so everybody uses them because it would be stupid not to do them. Um, that's that's really the point. Not using stereotypes is irrational, and that's why everybody does it, right? It's very simple. Um, also, uh, doing this should increase the accuracy. And so, actually, there are some studies where they measure people's stereotypes, and then also look at uh, the ones would have more accurate stereotypes, whether they they seem to use them correctly when presented with new evidence. So they have these like mock trials where you're given some vague description of some person. Then you assign your belief uh, probability of whether this person is some other thing, say a criminal, and then they give you a bit more information. They see then what's your new belief. They see if you do this updating correctly, right? Do you over update or do you under update? Like, um, so there um, you have to do this moderately correctly to kind of improve your accuracy. Uh, if you're like erratic in your estimates, you just go go from like zero to one hundred percent. You're probably doing it wrong. And if you read the book um, Super Forecasters by Ted Locke, uh, and also his uh, expert political judgment, uh, then you'll see that the people who tend to, tend to update often and in small increments, these are the people with the most accurate beliefs. So basically people who kind of ADHD like sit and up, obsessively follow new evidence, they go like, hmm, this adjust my, this new evidence changes my belief from 15% chance to uh, to 20% chance or 17 or something, right? These small incremental changes. Um, there is some research uh, on this kind of mock trial thing we're updating that it shows that people generally do do it in an accurate way, uh, although not perfectly. Um, but you kind of expect this from evolution, right? If, if if people could not, of course, update beliefs at all, then, I mean, what's the point of updating them, right? Because uh, survival eventually depends on, on getting your beliefs about the world and especially other people correctly. Uh, if you think someone is not likely to kill you and eventually they kill you or they uh, your wife is cheating on you or something, right? Uh, eventually, eventually you your fitness becomes lower and so evolution selects for true belief, at least to some extent. Um, and so it'd be very strange if, if humans weren't, you know, on average kind of accurate dealing with groups. Um, these studies, of course, are even smaller and fewer than the other ones and so they really need pre-registered replications and so that totally means you, you should do it. Um, Going further, of course, uh, not everybody is happy about this Bayesian rationality seeming to support stereotyping and in, indeed kind of discrimination. Um, and so we have this extremely hilarious paper uh, trying to say that, no, 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 this is not the case. And they call it Bayesian racism, which is extremely delicious. Um, and it's from 2010. And um, it turns out that in 2010 years prior that we have this uh, Tetlock guy who's cool, of course, and... Um, he, he talked about he had this paper about forbidden base rates and so you can see where it's going it's like yeah some stereotypes are basically priors and priors makes you more accurate but we as a society at least some people say there's certain priors thou are not allowed to use they're forbidden and heretical kind of factors uh and so for instance if you look at the law we're gonna shrink me again here whoops that's very small if we look at the law we mostly know that uh, we're supposed to be equal for the law. That's the point of blind lady justice here. Um, but also everybody knows no one is exactly equal for the lawyer or for the law. And I mean, for the mundane reason is that if you have a better, better lawyer, then uh, then you get a better representation and less likely to get convicted. Also, if you're smarter, 
you probably know how to defend your, yourself either. So if we banned lawyers and only let people defend themselves, then still, you know, smarter people or people who studied law, right? Uh, they would tend to get, uh, you know, more fair or, you know, better justice from their perspective, right? There's, there's no way getting around this fact that uh, the law cannot be exactly equal, but at least we can we can make it uh, equal in, in a sense that uh, no one is above the law. Um, and so this equal for the law really uh, has a historical interpretation is that there used to be uh, different uh, legal requirements and so on, uh, rules for like nobility and uh, the royalty and so on. And in many uh, democracies uh, that have kind of uh, a royalty on top, uh, technically speaking, say the king is above the law, or the princes, and so you cannot be prosecuted at all. And so if they drive over a red light and the police stops the car, then they roll down the window and it's like, oh, your majesty, yes, I'm sorry, but I can literally not give you a fine. Uh, this this has happened a bunch of times in Denmark. And so every time that happens, the tabloids go like, ah, the princes are doing speeding again. And then the queen has to go talk to her son and she's like, big no-no, uh, a discretion, um, a digression, that's the word. Um, anyway, so going back to the law itself, still we have some priors that are okay. Uh, for instance, uh, we have uh, prior convictions. And so in the sense that you still have to say, uh, you still have to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt or some phrase like that, some kind of evidence standard like that. However, if the tre the, the punishment is not equal for the law, if, uh, if you have uh, prior convictions for the same sort of thing, uh, the law usually strikes you harder in, in some sense. In the U.S., they kind of lock you off for good in some places, right? Free strikes and you're out. Um, so definitely the law doesn't really think that everybody's equal. They think that people who've done criminal stuff in the past, these people are obnoxious, so we're going to lock them away for a longer time this time. Um, it's totally based on the idea that, uh, the sensible idea that if you've done something criminal before, you're probably going to do it again. And so if we, you come in the third time with the same crime, the, the justice is sitting like this, I'm tired of this guy, right? Um, there's a funny one in Denmark is that they recently made this law where um, there's double punishment zones. And so it's it's basically kind of an anti-gang law or anti-ghetto. So it's it's basically an, an, uh, an a racist law. And it's because it says that people who live in these ghetto areas where t there's totally a lot of immigrants, uh, now every like gang-related crime gives two times the punishment, right? Um, so you could make this 10 or whatever, right? It's just, it's their way of, uh, you know, uh, being against these like immigrant gangs without actually saying anything about uh, immigrants in the law because that way they comply with all the anti-racist uh, stuff that uh, the activist judges have come up with and um, and so on so the, of course the question is there's also a, a bunch of other laws that go like you can't discriminate against age sex race iq sometimes citizenship or maybe maybe not uh, or origin or there's a bunch of other ones of these uh, so-called protected classes uh, but which 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 ones are protected, which ones are not? Apparently, uh, prior convictions are okay, residential area okay, but uh, age is not okay. But of course, we know that no one hires people who are close to retirement age because that would be stupid, right? Um, and no one hires women who are about to get pregnant, uh, in the, at least not in the private sector, because that would be stupid. But it's also illegal to do this behavior, even though every rationality demands it. And so we have this. We have this uh, legal area where everybody kind of has to break the law because if you hire, uh, if you're a small company, you hire a pregnant woman, well, she's going to go uh, uh, doing uh, her mothering stuff. And that means, uh, at least by Scandinavian law, you have to support her while she's no longer working for you. And if you're a small company, that's probably going to crash you. So you don't do that. And if you, do, you can't legally say you're discriminating against them, but you can definitely make up some kind of reason not to give them a callback. Uh, and then, of course, eventually you get some angry academic after you and it keeps going like this, right? Because the, the, the legal system is pretending something uh, that you have to do is illegal, right? It's that whatever the case, that's how it works. Um, so, of course, a different way of studying what the law does is that you can look at mock trials. Um, so you, you do kind of a fake trial. You give people to come in, pretend to be a jury uh, for the countries that have this, then you serve them some uh, some evidence about this or that guy, and then you like vary the race or the sex or something. Uh, there's tons of these kind of studies. Uh, they're mostly small, as far as I can tell. I haven't found a large one, but I may be missing something. So they're probably very p-hacks, and that's why I'm not going to look them over. Um, you can see, of course, that if you know the average social ecologist is extremely woke, 
you also know what they want to do. They want to show that the legal system is unfair or racist. Uh, so what they really want to do is that they uh, they want to say the justice system is racist against blacks or something. Uh, they don't normally study sex, of course, because you know why. Uh, taking into account uh, stereotypes using priors, that, that favors the, the, the better performing group. And if you're looking at crime and sex, everybody knows that men are five to ten times more uh, violent crime than women. Uh, I actually could not find a, a single crime type that men do less than women in the Danish statistics. Um, so everybody knows that men are more criminal. And so if you do a mock trial, then people tend to find men more guilty and, uh, and probably also give them longer sentences. And um, that's just kind of how the uh, how the utilitarianism or would work out if you kind of used uh, p hacking or if you used the stereotypes. Um, anyway, if you do uh, instead of instead of doing mock trials uh, where you can hold everything perfectly constant, you look at real trial data. Uh, you get different problem is that um, you can't measure everything that's relevant uh, that's given to the jury, uh, and you can't measure everything with exact accuracy. Uh, and so um, you're going to have some either measurement error or stuff that you've omitted that the jury is taking into account. Um, and anything that you've failed to measure, either by not including it or not measuring it 100% accurate, which you can't, um, it's going to be a leftover bias in the regression that's favoring this or that group, right? Uh, and so when you do these studies, it's ba the conclusion is virtually guaranteed you're going to, if you have enough sample size, I mean, you're always going to find that uh, blacks are discriminated against because you're not measuring everything that's relevant correctly, right? Even even if they were not discriminated against. Uh, it's not actually obvious whether uh, justices would actually be using priors correctly, at least insofar as Bayesian rationality is concerned, because uh, justices are quite left-wing, and so they may be uh, trying to compensate for their own priors by, uh, you know, giving blacks a bit of a favor. Um, but it's very difficult to study this thing for the reasons that uh, that Westphal and Arconi outlined. So you should totally read their paper, which is a funny title. There is, however, a bunch of other data um, that's large sample size. And there is, it turns out that there is this social science um, survey system, I would say, where you can submit studies that you want done and kind of pay them or something. And then they kind of do the survey for you. So you don't have to do that. And then they also deposit this data in their system. And then you have uh, the data is embargoed. You, only you can access it, but only for one year. So after the one year, data becomes public and everybody can do it or get it. And so uh, this uh, Sigurel guy, um, who's also good on Twitter, uh, he's also just good in general, you, he discovered uh, this, this service of the data, data sets. And he looked through all the data, or at least all the recent data, and he found 17 data sets with large symbols that do these kind of experiments where people are being forced to choose between one candidate and another or make some kind of decision where they, they vary the race at random. And so uh, since there's so many studies, there's 10,000 uh, white people in total and, uh, and almost 3,000 or close to 3,000 black people in total. And so uh, you can look at people's preferences for whites, like whites when they're judging whites themselves and when they're judging black people and black people when they're judging whites and black people. And it turns out that when you do this and do the forest plot, it, um, the average estimate of uh, white people is that they show no racial bias uh, in these studies on average. You can see they kind of vary between studies. Uh, this one uh, favoring white people, this one favoring black people and so on. And But on average, uh, the white people don't seem to be biased, at least in these uh, 17 experiments with a lot of different uh, traits. Uh, black people, however, uh, they were actually consistently somewhat biased towards other black people in the in these surveys. And this this stuff probably won't surprise you too much because um, uh, white people are the least ethnocentric people uh, on the planet. So it's not too surprising that they wouldn't really show much bias in this kind of way. And also they're being, of course, harassed in the media for being racist for 60 years or something. So uh, probably that has some kind of effect. Uh, of constantly being told you're evil and so probably some people are compensating and, uh, and other people are using the, the real priors or whatever. Uh, whatever the case, this conclusion is extremely on PC, of course, it completely undermines the narrative. Uh, so I'm kind of surprised he managed to get it published. Um, a different way of looking at it, you can go to civilian life and you can look at 
what actually people are doing. And so it works the same way as in uh, the, the studies of law is that usually you can find some kind of uh, some bias that people have some kind of preference for this or that group. Uh, and so what, in our view, this would tell us is that, you know, that the people are using the stereotypes, right, to some degree. Uh, and so in economics, the people who usually do this sort of thing, they, they talk about uh, what's called taste versus statistical discrimination. And so taste discrimination is when you're using, uh, you have some stereotype or you, not you're using, uh, you have some, you're discriminating between groups, uh, but there's actually no validity in the thing you're uh, you're using. And so you're, from an economic perspective, you're, uh, your preference is irrational. Uh, you're just foregoing free utility by having this preference uh, that's just kind of your personal opinion, man. Um, and so, for instance, we could say that, uh, let's say you have a company that do phone company, like telemarketing, and you just really like Red Hats uh, for whatever reason, but actually Red Hats are not better telemarketers than other people, and so you somehow just keep hiring Red Hats. That means that you're not hiring equally good uh, blondes or black hats and and so that's just uh, you're just forgoing uh, qualified employees and you're just really costing yourself money uh, statistical discrimination uh, is their term for when you use stereotypes in an accurate way and you're just kind of using priors to reach your goal um, and so for, and if you find out for instance that among models uh, people like uh, blonde models more you would be hiring blonde models uh, preferably right um, I don't know if that's the case, but I, that, that would be one kind of example, right? Um, and so uh, a typical case of this in a study is that uh, there's a study of uh, Airbnb hosts. And so they look at um, the race of the Airbnb host and uh, they sent these uh, hosts in real life. They sent them a large number of applications from uh, people with different names, some of which are obviously black, uh, African-American, and some of which are European-American, or at least not, not too obvious. Uh, they're probably European American, like John Smith or something, um, and uh, the blanks is going to be like uh, some typical you know, Jerome or something. Um, and what they find is that um, if you have kind of a, an empty profile and like not too many ratings, uh, reviews, uh, good reviews, then both black and white um, hosts actually have some uh, preference for the white ones, and you can see this as an obvious case of statistical dis discrimination. Because um, um, probably you know that uh, black people are more criminal and have less money and tend to have misbehave more in every kind of way you can measure. And so um, on average, if you don't know much about a person, they don't, they don't have a lot of ratings, then you would want to uh, play it safe, uh, uh, probably. And so you'd, you'd prefer the white one if you get two applicants at once, right? And so what they looked at is they looked at uh, responses by host or uh, time to answer in this, this sort of outcome. Um, this sample uh, is not really large enough to really be confident that the races discriminate equally, uh, but they did the interaction terms and it's not significant. Uh, so I would, um, it'd be very nice to see a pre-registered replication of this study as well, just to be sure. Um, so let's talk about social psychologists. And uh, social psychologists are always telling us, uh, well, except for like five people, then they're always telling us that stereotypes are bad and uh, they're like rigid, they're inflexible, they're exaggerated, not accurate at all, and using them is evil. So basically, they're they're gone all out on stereotypes. Um, however, that's basically what they tell you about stereotypes of people they when you use them about people they like. However, when they talk about or publish studies on, say, Christian fundamentalists, then suddenly uh, they're doing all stuff all the time and they're like really being very smug and uh, Christian fundamentalists are rigid in belief and uh, kind of stupid and, and so on, right? Um, unfortunately, I could not find a study of social psychologists' own stereotypes of people. Uh, however, there is uh, this nice study by Brant Crawford, um, some also not too PC social psychologists, uh, and they didn't look at uh, political leaning, but they did look at uh, IQ, sort of. They used the word sum, the 10 item IQ test, and then they asked people to kind of do the uh, feeling thermometer, as I recall, uh, on different out groups and or in groups as it may be. And so this this shows you the kind of the the average preference among s smarter and duller Americans, uh, which since uh, social psychologists are um, 
academics, we can expect them to be smart on average, and probably this this graph will be very similar for them. And so we can expect that social psychologists are going to really dislike people who uh, who are Christian fundamentalists. They're going to dislike big businesses. Um, they're going to dislike Christians, Tea Party, military, conservatives, Catholics, and working class people, and so on. And they're going to really like uh, non-whites, atheists, and QWERTY people, uh, illegal immigrants, and uh, liberals, of course. Um, so you can kind of form a mental image of the typical person, uh, smock leftist, and they're gonna they're gonna fit like this, right? Um, it turns out that there's actually no difference in how much prejudice or dislike you have for various groups by by IQ. The only the only thing that matters is which groups you dislike, uh, which is definitely very interesting. Uh, it kind of does the uh, the turnaround thing. And there is in fact a meta analysis of um, uh, liberals and conservatives measuring this kind of outgroup prejudice stuff and it also finds that they're equal uh, just opposite uh, so there's uh, basically a symmetry just d different targets um, unfortunately th this study had, hasn't yet been done uh, for the liberals and conservatives but I, as, as far as I can tell the data is from uh, AINS the American National Election Surveys so it's public uh, should actually you probably could download the data and do this for liberals and conservatives and that would be neat um, so to summarize, stereotypes of various groups are largely accurate when we can measure stuff well. Using them will enhance your accuracy when assessing humans and not using them is quite literally irrational. And so probably you already are, uh, but maybe you're not admitting it to yourself. Um, people do in fact seem to mostly use them in kind of rational ways. Uh, so that's not too surprising. Uh, the legal system sort of pretends that using them is always bad, but it does so itself, at least in some cases. And so um, this is uh, the question of, you know, who benefits and which group is protected and which one is not. Uh, it kind of depends on who's the lawyer and who's making the law. Uh, and so finally, taking stereotype accuracy and Bayesian rationality seriously, uh, it opens up a lot of legal uh, or raises a bunch of thorny legal and ethical questions that uh, people don't seem to have thought about a lot, and so one of my hopes with this video is uh, to get people to think about it a bit more. As usual, um, oh, well, I've got one slide. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, so what we really do is that uh, we, we need a lot more replication because a lot of these studies are small and haven't been replicated since the crisis, and they don't really have open data except for my own. And uh, so it'd be very nice if some other people came in and replicated some of these. Uh, it'd be very it'd be very easy to do a stereotype accuracy study, for instance, about um, uh, about uh, sex differences in say occupations. Like uh, you just get the, uh, the the data from the government, how many women work in this or that field, and then uh, field of employment, and then you just ask people to estimate the the over the sex balance. Right? Very very easy, and it's probably going to be super accurate stereotypes. Um, and then you can you can go to Twitter and troll with that. Um, uh, suggested topics, um, of course, I would think it would be very interesting to expand the, the stereotype accuracy literature to different kind of groups. Uh, cat people versus dog people. We do have some, some data about these people in OkCupid. Uh, I did look at them and they seem to replicate uh, uh, or the typical stereotypes like cat people are really are more depressed and more asocial and so on, but they also really are a bit smarter and uh, they have fewer kids and so on. Uh, so you kind of get the mental image of the, uh, the, the cat lady. Um, uh, state of accuracy of sex difference and mating success. I mentioned this earlier. Um, you'd kind of expect evolutionary that people who have more accurate stereotypes of the opposite sex, that they would also have more success in, in dealing uh, with the opposite sex. Uh, that seems like an obvious prediction from kind of evolutionary expectations, but uh, we'd be interested to see if it works. Um, you can do uh, prejudice study, as I talked about, many groups and political leanings. Um, it seems possible to do this with some of the public data, um, GSS maybe as well. Um, I'd be very interested to see the results of that. Um, stereotype studies done on academics. Um, what biases do academics have? It seems kind of obvious from the research, but uh, things that seem obvious are not always true. You have to check. Um, fortunately, it's possible to poll academics or poll academics, and uh, you should totally do that. Um, Stereotypes and the value of um, stereotype of uh, studies of the, the value of stereotypes and decision making. 
uh, that would be uh, it would be extremely interesting to see um, as we just talked about uh, and of course the onion has us covered from years ago that stereotypes are a real time saver they are indeed unironically um, references uh, for those interested in stuff all these calculations I did um, for the uh, stereotypes the values and the stuff I made up it's uh, it's done in this um, they're all in this public Spreadsheet, they can go look at uh, all the studies I mentioned. Well, not all of them, but most of them are here. And so you can look up the slides and get the stuff. And, and as usual, of course, if you want more of these kind of videos, you're going to send me your shekels and then I'm going to make more of them and also more of these studies. So, adios.